shout out to bring our Q Julius, she legend. We're gonna do a joint interview, yeah? Yeah, yeah we'll do a joint interview, Julius. Thanks for the support. You're a legend. Um, from your girls, Raven and Ellie. Welcome to the mother Relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Sandy Ryan versus Ana E. Esther Sanchez. Let's talk about the fight. Sandy Ryan started off this fight the way I expected her to. On the balls of her feet, on the move, fighting on the fly, using her height, using her length as to not make herself a, a stationary target. Opposite the ring, a stubborn customer, a durable one, and former two-division champion of Argentina, Ana E. Esther Sanchez. I want to say that since the Katie Taylor fight many years ago, Ana E. has shared the ring with a lot of fighters, a lot of familiar faces, and many of them seem to have struggled with Ana E. Whereas Katie, Katie made it look easy. Chantel Cameron fight, Jessica McCaskill fight, Ana E. Esther Sanchez gave the both of those fighters a very hard time yesterday with Sandy Ryan. She made Sandy work. Sandy Ryan, who started off this fight on the balls of her feet, fighting on the fly, attempting to walk Ana E. Esther Sanchez into shots. And there's a thin line between... There's a thin line between giving up a bit of ground to set up a trap and walk a fighter into a shot. There's a, there's a thin line between setting a trap and retreating. The optics of a fighter as statuesque as Sandy Ryan, that much height, that much length, giving up that much ground to a smaller fighter who's barreling forward. After a while, it looks a certain way. Sandy landed some punches. She landed some big punches, some big shots. But she couldn't seem to discourage Ana E. Esther Sanchez from barreling forward, going for looping rights. Body shots. Ana E. Esther Sanchez is made out of some tough stuff. We saw a more mobile Sandy Ryan at the start and a more assertive Sandy Ryan in the middle. She started holding her ground, getting off big punches, sitting on those shots, sitting on those punches, doing damage. She didn't spend as much time circling away in the second half of the fight as she did in the first. She was more assertive. Stepping into her punches. I've got to say, Ana E. Sanchez took Sandy Ryan's best. Seventh round was a particularly strong round for Sandy. She really laid into Sanchez that round. Finished strong. And Sandy definitely looked strong most of the last half, though I want to say that Based on this performance, I don't actually think Sandy's ready for the likes of a Chantel Cameron. I, I find myself questioning if she's ready for the likes of a Mary McGee, let alone the woman that beat her. It's not because Sandy's a bad fighter, far from it. She's got a great skill set, great physical dimensions for the weight. It's because they're moving her so fast. This is only her sixth professional fight, after all. Yeah, I'd be lying to you if I told you that I think she's ready for Chantel. I don't think she's ready for Chantel. The growing pains that young Sandy Ryan suffered in the first era of Faria's fight. The first. Performance we saw yesterday opposite the ring Ana E. Esther Sanchez. There's more work needs doing for Sandy. That's what I see. There's no shame in that. She only has six professional fights. I hardly think she's ready for somebody like Chantel Cameron, this division's undisputed champion, after just six professional fights. Sandy fought three times this year. Good schedule of activity. I'd like to see her fight three times next year as well. I think she needs to. I think she needs to bank those rounds. Get that experience. Because there's being ready to fight for a title and then there's being ready to win one and defend one sandy really does need to round out as a fighter she's got great tools great ability those eggs need more bacon still congratulations to her for advancing to a professional record of five wins with just one loss two recorded knockouts i was actually expecting that she'd knock out ana e esther sanchez and she did come close she almost did she almost finished her but almost doesn't count in the later stages of the fight she clearly had ana e esther sanchez hurt more than once sandy ryan stepping into her shots in effect collapsed the pocket she ended up smothering her own work if not for that i think she would have knocked out on a esther sanchez but it was still a good showing she did come very close to knocking sanchez out she just didn't give herself enough room once she had her hurt to put something on those shots she's too close not dissimilar from what you used to see from sean porter to where he can close the gap on a guy and get close to him but once he's there he ends up being too close and he can't really get good leverage for his punches. I saw that from Sandy yesterday. Still a good showing. Congratulations to her, but yeah, she needs more work. We then come to the heavyweight contest between unbeaten Flavio Wardley and Nathan Gorman. Highlight fight of the card for me, perhaps highlight fight of the weekend. It didn't last very long, but it was very entertaining while it lasted. Nathan Gorman got off to a strong start in that first round. In that first round, he was actually a lot more aggressive than I expected him to be. You know, I remember Nathan Gorman leading up to the Daniel Dubois fight. His bread and butter, his calling card seemed to have been being a defensive specialist, a defensive fighter, whereas in this fight at the start, 
He was very offensive, very aggressive, stepping into his punches, throwing his weight around. He kind of brought this outcome on himself because he was forcing Flavio Wardley to fight. Forcing him into exchanges in the pocket, deep in the pocket. Flavio's a very interesting character because he doesn't come from some deep amateur background like a Pat McCormick or a Joshua Buazzi, somebody like that. It's my understanding that before he went pro, Flavio, it's my understanding that before officially going pro, uh, Fabio only had a couple of white collar fights, but he shows real ability, real technique, and, and real punching power. To the eye, he's a more put together fighter at least than an Alan Bobbitt. Without the gung ho defensive lapses in judgment we see from a, a fighter like that, a guy who's willing to take one to give one. In this fight, the dichotomy seemed to have been a Nathan Gorman who was hell bent on imposing his will on Flavio, and Flavio was thereby forced to fight, forced to fight him off forced to let his hands go and as soon as he did as soon as he started putting punches together and going after nathan it's like i said ahead of the fight when fabio wortley lands he lands big he seems to have real stopping power at least at this level a good step up in competition for him from the kind of guys that he has been fighting didn't take fabio long to gain control of this fight while Nathan Gorman may have gotten off to a strong start in the first round, you know what they say, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And this fight finished with Nathan Gorman's corner throwing the towel. Yeah, after Flavio scored about three knockdowns, I think it was three knockdowns. I'm telling you, even though Fabio Wortley ain't some Team GB guy or anything like that, he shows real ability. He's got good feet, good snap in his punches, good combinations. He definitely has good power. So I wonder about this guy and how far he can really go because he's got some good qualities good physical dimensions 27 years old many good years ahead of him sporting a professional record of 15 wins no losses no draws with 14 knockouts 14 out of the 15 fights he's had so far have ended by way of knockout i think it's safe to say that flavio he does have bankable power you don't want to let this guy land clean richard lardy nick webb Daniel Marks, Eric Molina, and as of yesterday, Nathan Gorman. I like Flavio's progression. I like how they're moving him. I like his schedule of activity. He fought two times last year, three times. He fought three times this year. It's been a very productive year for Flavio. I'd like to see him fight three more times next year. One of Matchroom's more interesting unbeaten up-and-comers. An exciting fighter to watch. I've seldom ever seen Flavio in a boring fight. The prediction stuck, and Flavio won the fight the way I said he'd win the fight. Guy punches hard. We then come to the main event of that same card. Dillian White's ring return on the heels of his knockout loss. Tyson Fury opposite the ring, unbeaten American up and comer. Jermaine Franklin, who I think gave a good account of himself. I saw some cries of a of a robbery that Jermaine Franklin should have gotten the nod, that Jermaine Franklin should have won a decision. I saw those cries from Jermaine Franklin himself, and I have to say... Bullshit. No, it wasn't a robbery. It was a close fight. It was a tight fight. It was a competitive fight where both men had good moments. That's all it was. But boxing fans being the way that they are with their hot takes and knee-jerk reactions and some fight fans who make a decision about a fighter before a fight even starts. What do you expect? Over the years, Dillian White has become somewhat of a polarizing figure, not necessarily for anything that he did or anything that he's saying, at least not in particular. He's become a bit of a polarizing figure due to his association with Eddie Hearn and Matt Shroom. They talk about the guy like he never fought nobody. They talk about the guy like he never beat nobody so let's just address that and get that right out of the way that i myself am not in agreement with all this robbery talk in association with this fight i didn't see a robbery i saw a fight where it was close it was competitive but more often than not the eye-catching punches and the eye-catching shots the ones that were actually landing most of the scoring blows that i saw were coming from dillian that's not to say that jermaine didn't get off a couple of shots of his own of course he did it's a boxing match but most emphasis on most eye-catching punches and eye-catching shots the scoring blows most of those were coming from dillian who was using a a cross guard you don't often see the cross guard in today's usually what you see is your conventional high guard or the shell guard you seldom see the cross guard these days george foreman quite famously used to use it and it worked for him dillian white uses it and it worked for him dillian blocked a lot of punches using that cross guard 
A lot of shots really didn't get through for Jermaine. In spite of his combinations and his speed, the snap on his punches... I think people are confusing Jermaine Franklin's combinations and how eye-catching they were at times with actual scoring blows because a good amount of the time, he wasn't getting through. He wasn't getting through the guard. No shots weren't landing on Dillian's cross guard. Dillian White himself was angling away from those punches, riding those shots, riding those punches. That's what I saw. It was a good competitive fight. Good comeback fight for Dillian White against an unbeaten up-and-comer who was several years younger and fresher, albeit somewhat less active. I said it ahead of the fight. In the last three years, Jermaine Franklin has only seen action once, just once, and that was earlier this year in May. A more active Jermaine Franklin perhaps would have been able to eke out a decision because he would have been sharper. But when you've only fought once in the last three years, and the last guy that you fought leading up to this fight was a journeyman with losses in the double digits. This was a big step up in competition for Jermaine Franklin, whether people want to acknowledge that or not. Jermaine Franklin was hurt several times throughout the course of this fight. Stagger. In the final round, he was sent careening into the ropes, and it was the ropes that held him up. When the ropes hold you up, you know that's supposed to be ruled a knockdown. For whatever reason, the referee didn't see it that way. But he should have. I want to say that most of the photo finish punches in this fight, the scoring blows, the ones that landed, caught my eye. They were coming from Dillian White. Good shots upstairs, good body shots downstairs. Dillian White being somewhat of an accomplished body puncher. Jermaine Franklin showed good durability. He showed a good beard. Jermaine's got some admirable qualities, I think. He gave a good account of himself, and I wouldn't mind seeing him opposite the ring, a Zile Zhang or a Otto Valin, those kinds of fighters, on other matchroom shows. Moving forward, I would like to see a more active Jermaine Franklin in 2023. Jermaine Franklin didn't win this fight. He didn't win this fight just because he did better than many of you expected. What you expected don't even come into it. Because what the fuck were you expecting? Dillian White was in action against Tyson Fury earlier this year, and he got knocked out. So the guy's not gonna go back to looking like a killer straight away. He's on the rebound. He's on the bounce. Context is key. It wasn't a dominant showing for Dillian, but going into the final round, I felt this guy's gotta be up by at least a point. At least a point or to. And he definitely won the final round. Came very close to stopping Jermaine Franklin in the 12th and final round. So you know. Jermaine feels that he was robbed, but me personally, I don't want to see a second fight. I don't want to see a rematch. I think it was a good comeback fight for Dillian White. The fact that he was opposite the ring, someone who was making him work for it, I think that's what he needs. And I think it was a good advertisement for Jermaine Franklin. A young, serviceable heavyweight who can make a guy work for it and who perhaps, if he's more active, can start winning some high-profile fights of his own. But make no mistake, I think Dillian won the fight. Don't think it was a robbery. I think it was competitive in spots, but I do think Dillian edged it out. But the scorecard's a little bit too wide. A little, yeah. That happens, but I do think the right man won the fight, and that's what's important. The story now is that Eddie Hearn... Anthony Joshua and Dillian White may be returning to action early next year on separate dates leading up to their rematch. Months of February and March. We know they were looking at a March ring return for Anthony Joshua, and you know what? He does need to be busier. He does. I'd like to see him get out there at least three times next year. There's already talk of Deontay Wilder. For his longtime manager, Shelly Finkel, they say they want to do the Anthony Joshua fight straight away. And we'll get into that. We'll get into the Wilder stuff. I do feel that Dillian White needs at least one more fight. Before a Joshua rematch really becomes attractive and, and marketable and sellable, we need to see Dillian White out there one more time, and he needs to be dominant the next time because he wasn't this time. And that takes care of a Joshua versus White rematch as far as Joshua versus Wilder and what Deontay Wilder's longtime manager, Shelly Finkel, is saying. He's saying, we would take that fight in the UK or the Middle East. We will do it next. We understand Eddie Hearn might want the Dillian White fight, but the fans would like Wilder versus Joshua. Let's make a deal. Where to begin with these people? Eddie Hearn got in contact with Shelley Finkel by way of email correspondence ahead of Deontay Wilder's fight with Robert Hellenius. And by all rights, the talks to do a Joshua fight if Shelley Finkel and Deontay Wilder were serious. The talks should have started then. Just to get the ball rolling, having that preliminary dialogue. So that by now, in theory, they may have gotten somewhere, ironed out certain details of a potential deal. So the fact that Shelly Finkel waits good up until wheels are already in motion. He waits good up until they start planning Anthony Joshua's ring return in either February or March or whenever it is. He waits good up until then 
to start talking about a Wilder fight again, knowing full well they're under orders to take on Andy Ruiz. Because of that, on the face of it, I don't know that Shelly's interest in doing this fight is sincere, or if this is just another arm of promotion for an Andy Ruiz fight. You know, they're taking a page out of Tyson Fury's playbook. You know exactly who it is you're going to be fighting next year. And what this is, is promotion by way of name association. Attach Anthony to whatever it is Wilder's doing, even though you know what Wilder's about to do. Both Deontay Wilder and Andy Ruiz in the last 12 months have appeared on pay-per-view, and both pay-per-views failed to crack 100,000 buys. Andy shared the ring with Luis Ortiz Tease and Deontay Wilder more recently shared the ring with Robert Hellenius. And those pay-per-views... Nobody bought them. I'm willing to entertain a scenario where, because of this, perhaps Shelly Finkel and Deontay Wilder, they don't really see the value in an Andy Ruiz fight, and they know that the big money, the real money, is in an Anthony Joshua fight, and they are now, perhaps, more so than before, they are now, perhaps, willing to play ball. I'm willing to entertain that scenario because of certain realities. I mean, it's possible, but this could just as easily be more of the same, more of what we've seen in the past. You just like throwing this guy's name around to help sell your fights. Quite shamelessly, I might add. I don't know that I can believe this is a genuine interest in doing the fight and doing the fight next year. But what I do know is Anthony Joshua is on the bounce. He's on the rebound. He needs a comeback fight. Deontay Wilder, he already had his with Robert Hellenius. So you know what you can do? This is what you can do. You continue to work on Anthony Joshua's next fight, either February or March, whenever it's going to be, against whoever it's going to be against. And you plan the Deontay Wilder showdown, that transatlantic fight of former champions, you plan that for the summer. Instead of doing a Dillian White rematch in the summer, you do Joshua versus Wilder in the summer. That's one way you can work this out. And if the Deontay Wilder people are serious, if they really want to do this thing, They'll play ball. There's no reason. Deontay Wilder's last box office fight was billed as a PBC on Fox pay-per-view, the Robert Hellenius fight. And it's widely speculated that Fox will be leaving boxing beyond this year. The question then becomes, will Deontay Wilder return to Showtime? Because if he does, Showtime ain't got the scratch. They ain't got the cash to pay him. They can't pay him for Andy Ruiz or anyone else would he get paid to fight Anthony Joshua. And Showtime's involvement shouldn't be a hang-up of any sort when Deontay Wilder hasn't boxed on that platform since the Dominic Brazil fight of three or four years ago, however long it's been. It shouldn't be a requisite that Showtime be involved. Deontay has to fight on his own. It's as simple as that. If you're talking about doing this thing in the UK or the Middle East, that means you're talking about Eddie Hearn bankrolling the fight. That, that's what you're talking about. And if he's the one bankrolling the fight... You don't fucking know anybody in Saudi Arabia. You ain't in charge. You ain't the A-side fighter. You do as you're told. And you fight when and where you are told to fight.